Well, hello, everybody, and welcome back. This is uh, the Jason Stapleton Program, broadcasting once again from the Random Walk Studios here in the heart of America. Darren is, of course, out again. He's... He's still sick, man. He must, this is the, uh, I haven't ever known him. We've been working together for, I don't know, seven years now or so, and I have never known him to miss more than one day of work. So he must be, uh, he must be really hurting. So I sent him a text yesterday, and, and he seemed like he rogered up. He talked to me, so I, I guess he was doing okay that he was out of bed and coherent. But uh, you guys might just think about him. Maybe send him a nice note if you know how to do that. But uh, he's uh, hopefully he'll be back tomorrow, and we'll do some some live shows, and we'll do some video. But and I don't know. Um, I think it's kind of cool. I'm just sitting here in the studio having a casual conversation with you guys, and it's uh, it's intimate, so intimate. But anyway, uh, today it, it's a, the news day is a weird news day. But I thought I would go ahead and I found some good stuff that we can talk about. The first one is uh, talking about some uh, changes to the surveillance uh, that the DO Department of Defense uses, and I'm going to explain why that's important. And then we've got the the Clinton campaign and the dossier on the Russia and Trump scandal. So it turns out like oh, this whole Russia thing started with Trump because of a dossier that was released by a former British spy who claims that all of the that there was a connection and that the Russians are actively campaigning to try and support Trump and then there was a question as to whether or not Trump actually colluded with the Russians in order to help them support him. And this this dossier is what actually started the FBI investigation into Donald Trump and his campaign. Turns out that that entire thing was put together and funded by the Clinton campaign and the DNC. So doesn't mean it's not true. Again, you you, you got to look at this immediately. Those who are partisan will say, oh, well, then you could discount all of it because clearly it was they were all colluding in order to try and hurt Trump and Trump's the greatest guy ever. And, uh, and no, that's that's absolutely not it. It could very well be that uh, that, uh, that that Trump did all of the things that the report revealed. It's just or suggested, but the problem is, is that we haven't been able to find anything yet, and that's kind of the frustrating part. So I'll talk with you guys a little bit about that as the show unfolds today. And then we got two folks, uh, F- uh, Fleck, Flack, and Corker, who are Jeff Fla- Flake. I think it's Flake. I think that's how it's pronounced. I can't ever remember because I don't I don't watch a lot of news media anymore. Like every once in a while, I'll grab Fox News or MSNBC. But the problem is, they just they retread stories and most of the stories just aren't all that interesting. I suppose if you're interested in drama and you're interested in, uh, in, in kind of like the, uh, I don't know what you call it. The, uh, uh, the, the, but yeah, my phone is going off. As soon as I start doing the show, like nobody called me all morning and now I'm getting text messages. I'm getting phone calls. It's like, everybody wants to talk to me as soon as they know I start this show. But, um, you know, you watch the drive-by media, and I know drive-by is kind of a, a way overused term, but what they really are doing is they're trying to find the, the I guess, the um, as the world turns, uh, like <laughs> days of our lives kind of uh, uh, discussions about politics and, and what's happening in the world around you. And you really don't get to the meat of anything, which is kind of frustrating considering the fact that they run 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There's really no reason why the mainstream media couldn't put together like really good pieces. And some of them do like I I really dislike CNN as a news organization, but they do some special features that are really good. And they have some people who uh, some investigative journalists at CNN that actually create some pretty cool stuff. Um, Vice is kind of the same way. Vice has become it was at at one time what I think was really kind of an an objective uh, outlet, and now they've kind of become very, very much more liberal and uh, and biased and partisan in the way that they report. But the depth and the breadth of their uh, of their reporting is exceptional, and so. The, the simple fact is, you can't really go anywhere in America today and find unbiased news. So instead of like fighting that and then complaining and then going to the news outlet that supports me the closest or supports my ideas and reinforces my own beliefs the most, what I try and do is I try and look for really interesting pieces and really in-depth reporting and then try and separate, okay, what's the truth out of this and what is the bias that is inherent inside of the journal, inside of the, the reporting? And I, 
There may have been a time in American history when journalism wasn't biased and they, everybody just showed up and really wanted to do the right thing and they wanted to report the truth and they wanted to hold government accountable. And I imagine there are still people in journalism who are fighting to do that today. But that if that ever existed, it doesn't exist now. And so I get a lot of people who ask me, you know, what, what, what news do you go to? What do you look at to try and get the truth? And I said, I don't, I don't know. Today I have Yahoo. I have the Seattle Times. I've got Bloomberg in here. I've got uh, the Washington Post. Clearly not, you know, not, and Zero Hedge is one I go to frequently. I like what they've got. And then I've even got an article here from Fox News. So as I'm, as I'm trolling through the stack – and uh, and trying to find good articles, all I'm really looking for are interesting stories that are detailed enough that I can kind of parse through what's true and what isn't. And then I do my the best job I can of presenting you what the facts really are. But let me – instead of talking about what I do, why don't I actually do it? And I'll dive right in here and talk about this surveillance program. Now, this is from Yahoo. And um, this report is actually has actually been authenticated by both the Air Force and the Department of Defense. They told Reuters where this story came from that the documents that I'm about to reference are authentic. So this is absolutely true. And it says the U.S. government has broadened its interpretation of which citizens can be subject to physical or digital surveillance to include homegrown violent extremists. The new manual, released in August 2016, now permits the collection of information about Americans for counterintelligence purposes, quote, when no specific connection to foreign terrorists has been established. Now, we know that there is uh, – we've got the Freedom Act and the Patriot Act before that, and, and we know that the government is collecting all of your – at least your metadata that's coming off of your phone and probably everything. Given the, the, the massive amount of storage that they have, I would imagine that they are collecting every phone number, every email, every text, and it's all being just archived somewhere for them to draw upon whenever they need it. That would make the most sense. And from what I understand, that's not only possible, it's highly probable that they're doing that. And I, I use only as my point of reference for that the fact that in the beginning they said they weren't doing it. And then they said, oh, yeah, we're doing it, but we're only doing it for people outside of the United States. And they said, oh, well, well yeah, we're doing it for, for people inside the United States, but only people that we know are talking to people outside the United States. And then they said, oh, no, no, well, I guess we're doing it for everybody. And every time we would get a – we get an update. Uh, or, or something is revealed, there's a leak that happens, the government comes back out and says, oh, yeah, yeah, well, we weren't telling the truth exactly. But yeah, so, so now we're at a point where they say, no, 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 we're collecting everyone's metadata, but it's just the metadata. Like, that's all, that's all we're doing. And if you think that it stops there, I just think that's, that's foolish. But I mean, whatever, it, it doesn't matter. But we already know that the government is kind of collecting that information and storing it and housing it. But in order for them to actually kind of investigate that information, they at least have to go to a FISA court. Now, that's pretty easy to get around now because they changed the, the necessity in order to get a court order uh, for surveillance or spying on an individual by simply stating that the government has to have a need you see, you, under the Constitution, the government needs more than just a need. It, it has to present evidence that it thinks a crime has been committed, that it thinks somebody's guilty of something and they want to go look at it. And they've got to identify on the warrant that's going to be issued exactly what is going to be searched, what they intend to take, and who it is they want to, who it is they want to surveil. And so that's the way the Constitution reads. The way the FISA court interprets it is, ah, you know, if there's a government need, if the government shows up and they say they need the information, we'll give them the warrant. But at least there's that step. Now we're talking about the Department of Defense. Now we're talking about the CIA, which up until now did not have the ability to just randomly spy on American citizens because they thought that they might pose a threat. Let me read a little bit about this so that you understand what I'm talking about. Executive Order 12333, signed by former President Ronald Reagan in 1981 and later modified by George W. Bush, establishes how U.S. intelligence agencies such as the CIA are allowed to pursue foreign intelligence investigations. The order also allows surveillance of U.S. citizens in certain cases, including for active uh, activities defined as counterintelligence. It goes on to say, under the previous Defense Department manual, the definition of counterterrorist activities, which was published in 1982, the U.S. government was required to demonstrate a target was working on behalf of a foreign power or terrorist group. So prior to this, if I, if I can just make this really clear for you, prior to 
this change of the manual. In order for the CIA to come and surveil you, uh, and basically run run counter counterintelligence operations against you, they had to sh- they had to prove that you were working on behalf of a foreign government, or at least prove that they thought you were. Now that's out the window. They don't actually have to make that connection. All they have to do is say, well, we think that there might be a connection here, or nah, maybe there's no connection, but we still think that this guy might do somebody some harm. Now, I know some people think about this, and they rack their brain about this, but yeah, Jason, isn't this good that we've got people who are watching us to this type of stuff and, and who are really preparing, and maybe we can stop the next San Bernardino shooting? Right, because they reference that stuff inside of the article here. They say, you know, what would be considered homegrown terrorism, and they they talk about that. And here's the problem: if if men were angels, no government would be necessary. Right, we wouldn't need laws if men did the right thing. But we know that men are human beings are imperfect, and many of them are just downright terrible people. And so. There are two big problems with that. No, no more. Yes, if they, if if the guys who were working this program were absolutely, you know, straight as an arrow, honest as could be, and we never had to worry about whether or not they were going to use this power nefariously, then it would be fine. But we know that that's not true. We know that men are fallible. We know that the people who work there are corruptible, and the people that they work for are most certainly corruptible, if not already corrupt. And so you have a big problem with the fact that this power can easily be abused, not just because they have the authority to do it, but because they don't have to ask anybody for it. These guys operate completely in secret. And that's actually what uh, Sarah St. Vincent, uh, a surveillance researcher with Human Rights Watch, uh, who first obtained the document, said. She said, what happens under 12333 takes place under the cloak of darkness. We have enormous programs potentially affecting people in the United States and abroad, and we would never know about these changes without these documents. They, they received these documents because of a freedom of information request. That probably took them two years to get. It says, the Internet and social media has made it easier for terrorist groups to radicalize followers without establishing direct contact. This is from... Uh, Mauer, who works for, let me see who it is, National, uh, the Defense Department. And he says, we felt that we needed the flexibility to target those individuals. And I say to myself, is that all it takes? Is that where we're at in America today that we don't, all it takes is one guy saying, you know, I think we need a little bit more freedom to, you know, to, to, to go after these sort of individuals. I need a little more flexibility. They don't even say freedom. They say flexibility. We just need a little more flexibility in, in the law. It's, it's, it's kind of funny. It's like, yeah, wouldn't it be great if you could just kick down somebody's door if you thought they might be selling drugs in there? Well, we don't know if he's selling drugs in there. We don't have any evidence he's selling drugs in there, other than the fact that he posted a uh, you know a marijuana leaf on his Facebook page. But you know he might be selling drugs out of there, so we'll go kick his door down and raid his house without a warrant or even a suspicion of a crime. But we we really need that flexibility because how else are we going to catch all of these you know these terrible potheads, <laughs> right? It's ludicrous. No, the law is established to protect individuals, and, and what, what frustrates me so much, and I actually wrote this in the in the opening piece for the for the show, is when every day I turn around, my politicians are trying to uh, persuade me, convince me that they're there to help me, and that they can fix my problems, and and that they really want to be a support to me in everything that I do. And the problem is, it all involves me giving them more money, more power, or more authority in exchange for them taking over some aspect of my life that uh, maybe is hard. But when it comes to stuff like this, when it comes to real violations of uh, of my liberty, they're nowhere to be found. Not only are they are they silent when this stuff is happening, but they're powerless to make any changes. I mean, what 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 politician? They just changed the rule. That's all they did. They just rewrote it. Where were where were our elected representatives protecting our liberties? They're asleep at the wheel. They're too busy making campaign contribution calls. They're too busy arguing and infighting over uh, over Hillary Clinton and and the next tax proposal and and Donald Trump and 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 what he says and who he says it to and what the the things that really matter 
the politicians are never there to help with. Unless it has to do with redistributing your money, taking more control over your life, or making empty promises to you, they really don't do a lot. And this is one more example of your civil liberties being slowly but surely eroded. And, and it's unfortunate. But guys, let me tell you, uh, some of that stuff might keep you up at night. But if you've got a new mattress from Helix Sleep, you're going to sleep like a baby. I got one of these mattresses. It is incredible. It was so easy. I go on the website. I answer a couple of quick questions about how much I weigh and how tall I am and what type of bed I like. Do I like a firm one or a soft one? And if you've got a significant other, you can actually uh, you can actually customize each side of the bed so that your husband or your wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever, that they can have a comfortable night's sleep as well. And Helix Sleep is great. They just they send you the mattress. It's really easy. It, it comes right in the mail. You just slide it on the bed and open it up. It's, uh, it's great, and it doesn't cost you a fortune. So there are a ton of online mattress retailers popping up these days, uh, and it's not a one-size-fits-all solution. What you need to do is go to helixsleep.com forward slash Stapleton and take two to three minutes to fill out their sleep quiz. Go to helixsleep.com forward slash Stapleton right now and you can get 50% or sorry, excuse me, $50 towards your custom mattress. That's helixsleep.com forward slash Stapleton for $50 off your order. Helixsleep.com forward slash Stapleton. You guys really are going to love this mattress. It's, it's exceptional and it's not going to break your bank either because a lot of these mattresses can cost, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. Not at Helix. So go check them out. Okay, so let's talk about this DNC and and Hillary collusion on this dossier. I'm, I'll read to you a little bit from the article from the Seattle Times. They really do a good job of breaking it down, and and then we'll talk through it just f- briefly because I, I kind of hit on it already. But the Hillary Clinton campaign and the Democratic National Committee helped fund research that resulted uh, that resulted in a not, in the now famous dossier containing allegations that Donald Trump's of Donald Trump's connection with Russia. Mark, uh, it's E, it's E L I A S, Elias, a lawyer representing the Clinton campaign and the DNC, retained Fusion GPS, a Washington D.C. firm, to conduct the research. Fusion GPS hired dossier author Christopher Steele, the former British intelligence officer with ties to the FBI and the U.S. intelligence community. So, prior to this. Prior to the DNC and Hillary Clinton, the Hillary Clinton campaign hiring this guy, he was actually being retained by Fusion GPS to do work on Donald Trump and the, and the Russia connection through some sort of uh, Republican political donor. So apparently, here's as, as near as I can put the story together, here's what happened. Fusion GPS was hired by some unknown Republican who probably had it out for Donald Trump and was trying to find some way to make a make a tie to the Russians so that he could expose Donald Trump and and he would lose the the primary election. When that didn't work, uh, either the Clinton campaign got wind of it or the DNC got wind of what was happening. I would imagine what happened was the uh, the Republican said he was going to pull his funding, uh, probably because his candidate lost out. And then Fusion GPS started looking around for another buyer to continue the research. They turned their sights on the Democrats. They contacted the DNC or the Clinton campaign and said, hey, we got this. He's working on it. You know, what do you want to do with it? And so then the DNC or the Clinton campaign or both ended up picking up on it and they picked up the research and continued. So I don't know if that's exactly how it happened, but that would make the most amount of sense to me. And from there... Uh, they continued to work on Steele's report. And that report, after it was done, the do- what they call the dossier, was given to at least the lawyer for the Clinton at Clintons and the DNC. And uh, yet it is unclear, they say, how or how much of that information was shared with the campaign and the DNC. So there is your get-out-of-jail-free card. So we know that all of this happened. We know that Either the DNC or the Clinton campaign funded through this lawyer, Fusion GPS, to do this research. But we don't know, once the research came back, how much of it or what actually made it back to the Clinton campaign or the DNC. Now, the truth of the matter is, you and I both know how much went back there. All of it did. Every bit of it went back to them because they were the ones paying for it. But there's no way to prove it. Lawyer is not required to tell anybody. Fusion GPS gave it to the attorney. So how are you ever going to know? These are the type of these are the types of things that just frustrate the life out of me, irritate me to death because you can't ever get to the bottom of anything. 
Now, Steele's previous work in Russia, uh, in Russia for Great Britain, Great British Intelligence, and the dossier is a compilation of reports he prepared for fusion. It alleges that the Russian government collected compromising information about Trump, uh, and the Kremlin was engaged in an active effort to assist his campaign for president. Uh, and that the the real issue is this dossier is what U.S. intelligence agencies and the FBI used as as evidence that they needed to investigate Trump. So all of the stuff that's going on in Capitol Hill right now, as it relates to the Russia investigation and Trump is all predicated off of the, uh, the, the report that was issued by this guy Steele. And that report was funded and paid for by the DNC and the Clinton campaign. So you take that for what it is. Like I said, I'm, I'm not in a position to judge whether or not the report is true or not. I can tell you we don't really have any evidence that it was. We, we have some speculation that the Russians were, in fact, working to try and undermine the election and put Trump into power. The only reason we know that is because a bunch of people with security clearances in Washington and a bunch of politicians went into a room, read some reports, and then came out and said it was true. Now, if you trust your politicians, then, then you believe that. I happen to not believe anything a politician says. I want to see it. And I think that if that was actually happening, that the government has a responsibility to showcase that to you and I. If they want to make that kind of accusation about someone, to suggest that the Russians meddled in the election, there's no reason why they can't provide evidence for that. Now, there is absolutely no evidence that they actually were successful. Like, no one's making that claim. All they're claiming is the Russians influenced or tried to influence our election. And as of yet, we've had no connection at all as to whether Trump was involved at any level. So anyway, I look at all of that and I think to myself, I mean, yeah, it's what's important here is understanding that this thing wasn't generated out of a spirit of doing the right thing as is typically the case. People don't tend to do things just for the right reasons. They do it for their own self-interest. And this is yet another example of that. And, uh, and it's unfortunate. So anyway, all right. So let me talk, uh, let me, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do one more, uh, read here for you guys. And then we're going to get on to the talking a little about a little bit about internal politics. If you want to know why, uh, the government is turning a blind eye and your politicians don't know about major changes that affect your ability and your civil rights. It's because they're too busy fighting, infighting with each other and calling each other names and blasting each other on social media. But I'll get to that in just a minute. Uh, let me tell you about ZipRecruiter, guys. Are you looking for to hire someone? I mean, you might work at a company and be responsible for that, or you might need a new employee at your business, and it can be tough to find qualified people. That's, that's where ZipRecruiter comes in. I've used them before. They're an exceptional company. I got a ton of qualified applicants from all over the United States who were willing to come here to Kansas City to work for me. And it happened almost within 24 hours. Oh, it was probably before 24 hours I started getting people back. And that's because not only does ZipRecruiter have an incredible algorithm that finds the right people, but they will actually work with you to make sure you're using the right keywords to attract just the kind of people that you want. In fact, 80% of employers who post a, uh, a job to ZipRecruiter get quality candidates through the site in just one day. Now, right now, Find out today why ZipRecruiter has been uh, used by businesses of all sizes and find the most quality job candidates with immediate results. Uh, right now, you can post a job on ZipRecruiter for free. That's right, for free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com forward slash Stapleton. That's ZipRecruiter.com forward slash Stapleton. One more time, ZipRecruiter.com forward slash Stapleton. Now, this is the type of stuff that we're getting today in terms of news. And I'm going to talk with you about it just because it correlates with what we've been discussing earlier about the fact that politicians don't do what they're supposed to do. Normally I would leave something like this out of the stack because it's drama and there's just no reason for drama uh, other than the fact that it reinforces another story I have. So Republican Senator Jeff Flake of Arizona announced that he is not seeking re-election, and he announced that, uh, along with Bob Corker has also made that announcement, they're not seeking re-election. And he's now, uh, he gave a 20-minute, 17-minute dissertation as to why, on the House floor, as to why he's not seeking re-election, or excuse me, the Senate floor, as to why he's not seeking re-election. And among other things, he said, outrageous and undignified behavior has been excused by telling it uh, being excused as telling it like it is when it's actually reckless, outrageous, and undignified. 
He said, when such behavior emanates from the top of our government, it is something else. It's dangerous to democracy. So Flake is coming out and saying, I just can't deal with this anymore. I just can't tolerate how polarizing and Washington is. And I just, I just can't work under these conditions. I can't, so I can't be around a president who's so vile and, and so outrageous and so reckless. I just can't be associated with that, which we all know is garbage. It's, it's just, it's, it's total garbage. Since when have any of these guys cared? If they're in Washington, right? It's a filthy business. Washington is politics is the worst. I mean, think about it. You see what they want you to see. Can you, you have any idea what happens behind closed doors in Washington? I mean, it's a cesspool up there. There are a bunch of snakes and tyrants. Do you really think that the tweets that Donald Trump is putting out are really causing Jeff Flake to say, I just can't run for re-election. I just can't do it anymore. I just can't possibly have my name associated with this. Please give me a break. Here's what's really happening. So Corker and Flake have been uh, getting butt stroked and muzzle punched by the president for weeks or if not months because they're at odds with him. And unfortunately for them, uh, they have been actively working to ensure that neither one of these guys is going to get reelected. Uh, I don't know. I, I haven't looked at either one of their districts as to whether or not they could actually get reelected or not. But I know that Bannon has been actively working to try and get these guys, among others, out of Washington. And both of these guys are up for reelection in 18. And they are they are both deciding way ahead of time that they're not even going to try. And generally, the reason that happens, because once you get into Washington, you don't leave you got power and money and prestige, and you know nobody who gets there actually goes. That's why these guys are 80, 90 years old. You're, they're literally voting on bills in wheelchairs on oxygen you know, before they die. Look at <laughs> uh, Strom Thurmond. Um, who else? Bird. You know, these guys, are, these guys are ancient, and they're still there cranking out. Why? It's not, they got millions of dollars. They go in broke and they come out millionaires. They don't have to show up in, to, at Washington. They love the power. They love being there. And so that being the case, if he had a chance of being reelected, I don't think there's any way he would back out of this. Same thing with Corker. Corker's been around forever. Why now? It's not because of the president, because the president will be gone in four years. I mean, the, the idea that President Trump is going to be reelected, I think, is a is a really long shot at this point. But um, and the president said as much on on Wednesday or this morning. He uh, he defended himself and he said the reason that Flake and Corker dropped out of the Senate race is very simple. They had zero chance of being elected. Uh, they're now acting hurt and wounded. He said, and then he went back and talked about the uh, the meeting that he had with the Republicans yesterday. And he said the meeting meeting with the Republican senators uh, yesterday outside of Flake and Corker was a love fest with standing ovations and great ideas for USA. And I mean, does anybody really think that that's happening? Uh, does anybody really think that the president had walked into that meeting and everyone was just fawning over him and talking how wonderful he was and a love fest where everyone was standing up and cheering for everything that he had to say? I mean, <laughs> I suppose it's possible, but uh, much more likely is that it was a trying conversation from varying political ideologies asking, how do we do this and make everybody happy and actually not accomplish what it is we want to accomplish. Because they, they're talking about tax reform, right? So they got to figure out, because nobody really wants tax reform. And so they got to figure out how do we claim we've reformed taxes without actually reforming them and still get all of the special interest stuff in that we need to get in in order to make sure that the thing would pass. Because one of the things that's going to happen is as soon as a word of this uh, of this tax overhaul hits K Street, the lobbyists are going to come out and they're going to descend on Washington like the Prince of Darkness. And they are going to show up at these guys doorstep and say, hey, I want to make sure that my little special interest piece, my little tax break doesn't go away. And they're going to start throwing money at these politicians. And the sneaky, the the the, the, the dirty little secret is. The politicians know this is going to happen. They're expecting it. 
And that's why you'll see these guys hold out till the very last minute. They'll be undecided all the way up until the day of the vote, and they won't be sure what they're going to do. And then at the very last minute, they'll come out in favor or against. And what you'll have to look at is who ended up writing checks right before that happened. Because that's what they do. They hold out to the very end until these guys start stroking checks, and then they end up voting. Happens almost every single time, and certainly with a bill like this. And so what I think you're going to get is you're going to get lip service on actual tax reform. And we've already talked a little bit about what that looks like. Go back and listen to you know the last 10 episodes if you, if you want to find out what we're talking about. And they're going to provide lip service on tax reform. They're going to have enough pork in there and enough uh, special interest dollars that flow in that they can line their pockets for the next election cycle. And then they're going to maintain most of the special interest kickbacks and savings that, uh, that, that are on the books right now. And rather than try and fight this as an individual, like I fight it on this show. So I, 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 on this show, I'll talk about how terrible it is, and um, I will, uh, you know, I'll, I'll talk about how I think that if we're going to have the taxes ought to be evenly applied to everybody. So one industry shouldn't have a tax break over another industry. If that industry can't compete or can't be competitive, then it then it ought to go by the wayside. Um, if your company can't be competitive under the same economic conditions that the company down the street has to operate under, then you should go away. The government's job is to create a uh, is to ensure that there are no artificial barriers to your success. Does that make sense? So their job is not to make sure that this company or this industry is subsidized so that we can support the steel workers or the coal miners in Georgia. Their job is really to make sure that if you want to be a coal miner in Georgia, that it's as easy for you to do it as it is for the guy down the street. It's just a question of whether or not you have the intelligence, the drive, the ambition, and the know-how to get it done. That's really what the role – if there is a role for government, that's really what it is, protecting life, liberty, and property, ensuring that there are the, the law ensures that there are no artificial barriers to entry. It protects you. It doesn't hamstring you. But that's not the way that our government works. And so as we look at this type of stuff and when we look at tax reform, I, I – I look at that and I say, well, I can't fight it. Like, I know there's special interest money. There's no chance that that's going to change in the immediate future. So what do I need to do as an individual? Well, what I need to do is I need to know what the law is. I need to know what the loopholes are. And one of the cool things about being an entrepreneur is when you work for yourself, all of the tax advantages or the vast majority of the tax advantages that are available to large companies are also available to you. I pay taxes at the end of the year, not every month. Um, I get to write off all of my business expenses. I, you know, there's there's all kinds of extra benefits by being employed by being uh, an entrepreneur rather than working for somebody else. And the reason that those tax benefits exist is because large corporations have have petitioned the government and have paid for that privilege. Not that I agree with it, but it's there, and I take advantage of it. And so. One of the things that I've, I've tried to do and express to you guys over, over the last couple of years is the importance of you building on your own human capital. And if you have the drive and the determination to actually go out and start your own business, take what most people, I, I'm like, I look at what most people do and cause I'm in, I do inform, a lot of information marketing, right? So that I do a lot of uh, teaching. And what I have found is you can oftentimes make far more money teaching other people what it is that you do rather than doing that full time. So let's say that you're a, you, you do music for a living, right? And you, you, you're creative and, and you've done pretty good. I have a, a friend of mine who's a five-time Grammy award winner. Uh, is just one of the most incredible uh, producers that you'll ever meet. And um, just a great guy to boot. And we were talking the last time about uh, his business and he wants to start an education program because he recognizes how lucrative it is. I mean, this is a guy who wins Grammys and he's turning around going, Hey, how do I teach other people what I know and make a truckload of money doing it? Because that seems pretty simple and fun. I get to help other people and I get to make a lot of money in the process. There's a, uh, there's a new website called masterclass. If you go and check it out, masterclass is a they, what they do is they, they have a lot of writers. Like I, I took a writing class from James Patterson, if you can believe that. 
Uh, I took a, an acting class from Kevin Spacey. It's, it's really cool. I mean, these guys, they put together these courses from some of the, some of the most successful people in their fields and each of them are $90, 90 bucks. You can go and you can, you can check out this class that Kevin Spacey does on acting. Brilliant, right? Just brilliant. And they are making money hand over fist, bringing in these celebrities and letting these celebrities teach them what it is that they do. Even guys like Kevin Spacey are getting into information marketing. And so that's why I started, I, I, I put together this course called the Online uh, Business Kickstarter course. And it's on the website if you want to go check it out at jasonstapleton.com. And it's like 500 bucks. And what I do is I walk you through how to start your first online business. And I focus really, um, I focus primarily on information marketing and digital products, although we do talk about physical products if you have something tangible that you're trying to sell. And I don't, I don't bring it up to try and push people over there to buy it. If it's something you're interested in, you can go look at it. But for me, what it's really about is you taking charge of your future. Um, I was talking with someone today. And, uh, and I was talking about a, a life philosophy that I have that's a little bit different than other people. I said, I, I don't ever, I grew up in, in, I grew up, we didn't have a lot of money, right? And I can remember um, mom and dad saying, well, we can't afford that. We can't, no, we can't afford that. That's too much money. And, and you know, that was, it's fine. That's what most people say. We can't, we can't afford that. We've got a fixed income. We've got a budget. And that's not in the budget. But when I started my life, I guess my, my, own, my own career, I started to look at the world a little bit differently. And I was, I was talking on the, uh, um, to, to, to a friend of mine, and I just said, listen, I don't ever say things like, I can't afford that. Um, because that's a definitive statement. It, it's, it closes off your mind to any chance that you might actually be able to have what it is that you want. I said, I think it's, it's a poverty mindset. It's one that says, no, I can't, that's not attainable for me. And I said, I never want to have that feeling like there's something that I can't attain, that I can't go after. And so when I look at something, whether it's something that's a hundred dollars or a thousand dollars or $10,000 or a hundred thousand dollars, instead of doing that, I, I look at what my goal of whatever it is I want to achieve say, how can I afford that? What do I have to do in order to generate the money to be able to do what it is I want to do or have what it is I want to have? And I learned this from Tony Robbins, one of the very first books that I read. And it's a book that I attribute to really changing my mentality as a human being was Tony Robbins, Awaking the Sleeping Giant Within. Now, I don't care if you like Tony or don't like Tony. That book was incredible. He wrote it like a manual, like a workbook. And if you actually go through the book and when he tells you to stop and fill out the stuff, if you actually do that, it'll change your life. Changed my entire perception of how I looked at the world. I mean, I, I would love to be able to shake Tony's hand one day and tell him uh, what an impact he had on my life because it was that, that was the start that led me on the entrepreneurial career that ultimately put me here in front of this microphone. And having that type of poverty mindset where you're saying to yourself, well, I'm on a fixed income or I only make X number of dollars a year and that's just not an option for me, um, is, is so self-defeating and destructive. And so if you have any interest in, in learning about entrepreneurship and how to start a business and what that looks like and kind of walking through the process of figuring out what you do and what you would teach and how you might go after uh, people who are interested in that subject – it's amazing because the internet has given us the ability to tap into people all around the world. So you might have a super niche like thing that you do, like, uh, like trains or, or model airplanes or something. I don't know. And there are thousands, if not tens of thousands of people around the world who will not only, uh, who are not only interested in that subject subject, but will pay you for your expertise. It's, I mean, it's mind boggling, crazy. And so, I never want anybody to be in a position where they feel like they, 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 that it's hopeless, that they're just stuck. And until somebody shows up to offer them a raise, they just, they're not going to be able to move ahead in life. Take charge of your future, man. Take it by the reins and, and grab it by the shirt collar and drag yourself kicking and screaming to the life that you want. There's no reason that you can't have it. But anyway, guys, let me tell you all about me undies. Yes, me undies makes me feel good. They're, they're wonderful. Now, with tons of styles and patterns to choose from, 
Uh, both men and ladies, MeUndies will have the perfect fit for you, uh, for anyone and their personality. Most comfortable pair of underwear that I have ever worn. And you can check them out yourself by going to MeUndies.com forward slash Stapleton. That's MeUndies.com forward slash Stapleton. And when you do, you're going to get 20% off the best and softest underwear and socks that you will ever own with free shipping and 100% satisfaction guaranteed. That's MeUndies.com forward slash Stapleton. They got tons of styles, patterns to choose from for both men and the ladies. Uh, they The feeling is unmatched because they use naturally soft fabric that is three times softer than cotton. And for a limited time only, check out MeUndies' first ever glow-in-the-dark print. Lights out, baby. So if you, you feel like you feel like having a little bit of fun in the bedroom, get yourself some glow in the dark undies at meundies.com forward slash Stapleton. Go check them out, guys. You'll love it. All right. This is really interesting. I'm going to try and get this guy. We're going to close out the show with a discussion about cryptocurrencies. I'm always getting questions about cryptocurrencies, and it, it, sends, it, te- it's, it tends to stem around Bitcoin itself. And... There's always people think that I'm like against Bitcoin and that I think Bitcoin's going to crumble and it just keeps going higher and higher. And the truth is nobody really listens to what I say because I've I've just I've always said I think that it's a poor investment because it's volatile. And I still believe that over the long term, I'm going to be right about that. And there's going to be a lot of people who lose a lot of their savings because they've chosen to invest in a in a very unstable currency. Um, and then I've talked a little bit about the downsides of cryptocurrency, and my hope is that one day you'll have something that is free of government intervention and that you'll actually be able to use in everyday life. And we're getting one step closer to that. So I'm bringing up this piece from Zero Hedge. There's a guy named Jeff Garzik who started uh, a company called Block, and it's la- he's launching a new cryptocurrency that can switch between blockchains. So one of the concerning things to me is, okay, you know, Bitcoin is really the, uh, I guess, the, 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 the main leader right now. But you never know what's going to happen. It, it could fold and crumble in a matter of moments and another Bitcoin, uh, or sorry, another blockchain technology might, might pick itself up. And so it's, it's very new and it's not very widely used. It's mostly being used as a, as a trading or investment tool where we're putting money into this and the price just keeps going up and up and up. So everybody feels like they're making a ton of money, but there's just not a lot of people. You're not going to the grocery store and using Bitcoin to buy anything with. And so that's a little bit disconcerting too, because it, it, it's, it's not really become mainstream yet. And so I, I'm waiting for that type of stuff to happen. But one of the other things that concerns me is if one of these one of these things goes goes down and you're heavily invested in them, you you know, you're just going to lose your shirt. And so without being able to know which one's going to come out on top, you've either got to spread load your money throughout all of them, or you just got to pick one and hope that it's the one that survives. And it looks like Garzik's company is getting around that. They're announcing what they believe is a solution to the infighting and, uh, and perceives, and I'm sorry, uh, keeping money in the established cryptocurrency market. He said, they're unveiling what they're calling Metronome, a cryptocurrency that seeks to claim a series of firsts in cryptocurrency, including offering users the ability to switch the same token back and forth between blockchains, which is really cool. So, Garzik was one of a handful of key developers who wrote the underlying software for Bitcoin that's, that is known as blockchain technology. And there are currently about 1,100 different options of cryptocurrencies that are out there. And it's one of the reasons that it's, it's such a fragmented market right now and, and, and relatively unstable. And it makes it a, it makes it a very risky gamble for, for anyone who's putting significant amounts of money into it. And that's one of the reasons that they haven't been able to get really, really, really big investment dollars in. And so here's how it works. Metronome is a, is a coin and the coin can be uh, the coins that are used for applications on the Ethereum blockchain will be able to move to Ethereum Classic before jumping to something like Rootstock, which connects with the Bitcoin um, blockchain. And it says the mobility uh, mobility means that if one blockchain dies out as a result of infighting among developers or slackened use, metronome owners can move their holdings elsewhere. I want to get Jeff on the program because I want him to talk through with me and explain to all of you in detail how how the blockchain works, um, for those of you who don't know, and can walk you through this technology and what it's going to mean for, for, uh, for Bitcoin-type technology, for cryptocurrency technology. Because I think it's a 
it's a significant step in the right direction if I understand what I'm reading correctly. Because what it means is you can jump from any chain you want to. You can move from one coin or currency or blockchain to another. And if that's the case, that solves a massive hurdle for a lot of investors who worry about putting big dollars into uh, into cryptocurrencies. So we'll see what happens with it. Fingers crossed that uh, that it is everything that we hope it will be. And if I can get him on the show, I'll do a, I'll do an interview with him, and we'll talk a little bit about the future of cryptocurrencies and and the way way he sees uh, money being used in the future. But thank you all so much for being here today. I appreciate. It. I will be join the conversation. Follow Jason on Twitter, and don't forget to visit the live show fan page on Facebook. 